This is quite literally the most famous piece of contemporary art, but why is that? Marcel Duchamp literally went to a plumbing supply store, slapped the name Arma on this bad boy, and called it art. In fact, Dimitri Daskalopoulos, a Greek collector, paid nearly $2 million for the replicas. Not the originals, but the replicas. So why is this urinal an otherwise repulsive thing considered to be art? And what makes good or bad art in the first place? Today, I'm going to be diving into the area of philosophy known as aesthetics. Editing Isabel here. I just wanted to quickly add that all of the material that I got for this video was from the concept of aesthetic from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy by James Shelley. Just giving credit where credit's due. Okay, bye. Aesthetics is a very broad area of study and it aims to designate a kind of judgment, attitude, experience, and value to what we find beautiful. That is what we consider to be art. Furthermore, it aims at a way we can articulate perceptual basis of aesthetic judgments and how we can best understand aesthetic value and aesthetic experience. So let's get into it. Interest in aesthetics began in the 18th century when the concept of taste emerged along with the concept of rationalism. Rationalism is the idea that judgments of beauty are judgments of reason. That is, beauty can only be described empirically using things such as math and science. For example, the golden ratio and the rule of thirds are derived from mathematical formulas to analyze and create perfect composition. British philosophers began to develop theories of taste within this empiricist framework. And thus, like Gollum scrabbling out of his cave, a new theory emerged, the immediacy thesis. Now, what the immediacy thesis says is that judgments of beauties are not determined by reason, at least not in the sense where there are straightforward principles and concepts, but instead judgments of beauty come from other sensory judgments. That is, something is deemed to be beautiful by using the five senses. But this theory did not get far before it ran straight into some problems because there are certainly instances where there are principles and concepts that determine the aesthetic value of an object. For example, poems and plays are complicated works of art whose structure makes them complicated but also simultaneously makes them good works of art. In this case, the quality of a piece is something that is determined empirically to kind of quantify what sort of value it has. For example, Shakespeare's use of rhythm and dialogue, most famously with his iambic pentameter, is something we are taught back in high school as proof of the quality Shakespearean plays have. So if quality is something empirical, how does the immediacy thesis hold up? Well, David Hume defends the immediacy thesis by regarding the faculty of taste as something that is like an internal sense. Reed expands on this by saying that this internal sense comes from the way we perceive complex nature or structures of beautiful objects. That is, perceiving the nature of an object is one thing. Perceiving its beauty is another. So yes, the nature of a play is that it has dialogue, and Shakespeare is unique for his use of iambic pentameter. But this is simply a part of the nature of what a play is. The beauty that we perceive from Shakespeare is an experience within itself. So that was a lot in a short amount of time, but trust me, Hilary, the source material was way longer than that, so you're welcome. I definitely condensed it down quite a bit. Aesthetics and ethics are two areas of philosophy that for the longest time were sort of lumped together. And this is because both have to deal with nuanced judgments based on how we perceive the world. And because of this, philosophers such as Kant use the same terms and language with ethics as they do with aesthetics. Kant came up with the disinterest thesis, which says that pleasure in what is beautiful is disinterested. What he means by disinterested is that it is not self-serving. So interested is self-serving disinterested is not self-serving. Anyway, judging an object to be beautiful is disinterested because that judgment doesn't entail a desire to do anything in particular. A judgment just exists versus a judgment on an action to be morally good, for example, would be interested. And this is because that judgment issues a desire to bring that action into existence. If you are confused, 
It's okay, philosophers are still debating today what Kant meant by some things. Philosophy is really confusing. Just know that judgments of beauty don't serve a purpose to ourselves and don't require any sort of action and therefore are disinterested. They simply exist and this is what separates aesthetic judgments from ethical judgments. Just remember the disinterest theory is the idea that aesthetic judgments are not self-interested. So now that we have our starting frameworks for theories of taste, we can start going into the concept of aesthetics. We have a new term to learn, artistic formalism, which is the view that artistically relevant properties of an item, object, artwork, whatever, are the properties that determine if that artwork is good or bad in virtue. For art, the visual form of the subject is going to be the most relevant property and therefore will be the basis for us judging the aesthetic value of that piece. For poetry, it would be the way that rhythm, alliteration, imagery, syntax, and uh, all those such things are applied. Artistic formalism follows from both the immediacy and the disinterest thesis. The immediacy thesis is implied because the properties whose grasping involve reason are irrelevant to the aesthetic value of the artwork. Remember, the immediacy thesis is the idea that the value of an artwork is determined by what we can sense, not what we can reason. Artistic formalism is kind of the same thing, just refined further to say that only the relevant properties of an artwork are the basis for which that artwork will be judged. That is, those properties are the ones that can be sensed. Artistic formalism also follows the disinterest theory because it implies the irrelevance of all things capable of practical use. That is, it implies the irrelevance of things of self-serving use. So since formalism says that aesthetic value is judging on relevant properties, properties that are inherently disinterested, then the disinterest theory is implied. But artistic formalism didn't just come from these theories, they also came from art critics at large from many different fields. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, as a critic, Edward Hanslick advocated for the pure music of Mozart, Beethoven, Schumann, and later Brahms, and against the dramatically impure music of Wagner, as a theorist, he urged that music has no content but tonally moving forms. Hanslick favored Beethoven, Schumann, and Brahms, and he had a concrete basis to say why their music was better than Wagner. Artistic formalism provides a way to analyze art in a sort of critical data sort of way rather than by nuanced preferences. Formalism has always been supported by art critical data. However, a man by the name of Arthur Danto kind of just shot down this idea. Listen, I know I'm like dropping names left and right here, but these names are important to know if we're going to be talking about aesthetics. You know, I'm just kind of the opinion that like we should uh, we should know more about aesthetics if we want to be good artists. So yeah, these are these are important to learn. Anyway, this Danto guy made the case that the data doesn't support artistic formalism and perhaps never had. Anyway, this Danto guy made the case that the data no longer supported artistic formalism, but how is this so? It was very much inspired by Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes. I mean, yes, these were Brillo boxes that were painted, but they were indistinguishable from the real life cartons. Danto observed that for most any artwork, it is possible to imagine a another object that is indiscernible from an artwork but is not an artwork, and b another artwork that is discernible from an artwork but differs in artistic value. The reason why this is a problem for formalism, specifically for art, is because form alone neither makes an artwork nor gives it the whatever value it has. Because according to artistic formalism, art is evaluated by its form. Why is an Andy Warhol painting of Brillo boxes more valuable than the actual Brillo boxes? What well, makes an original Monet more valuable than a perfect replica? Because if it is true that these things are more valuable than the things they represent, then it can't be form that gives them their value. Formalism cannot explain why one is in a work of fine art and the other is not. And if formalism is true, then Duchamp's urinal is a work of fine art. But that doesn't quite seem right, does it? 
Do you have to have put any work into creating the urinal? In fact, the true artist would be the factory workers that made it or the machines that assembled it. We need more than just form to evaluate the aesthetic value of an object. We need context. And perhaps the direction we have gone with formalism is um, kind of like my coffee this morning, a little bit too strong. It's also important to note that Kant, the daddy of the disinterest theory, regarded poetry as the highest form of fine art because of its capacity to embody representational content in what he calls aesthetic ideas. Hume, who had his own version of the immediacy thesis, said, In many order of beauty, particularly those in the fine arts, it is requisite to employ much reasoning in order to feel the proper sentiment. So even though these two philosophers were proponents of the theories that brought about formalism, they believed to a degree that aesthetic value does have this sort of empirical element to it. Danto maintains that 18th century theorists would not know how to regard Warhol's Brillo boxes as an artwork, and this is because they would have the taste of someone who lives in the 18th century. Hume thought artists should address their works in their art history context, and one must place themselves in the same situation as the audience. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, he is allowing that artworks are cultural products, and that the properties that works have as cultural products they are among the ingredients of the composition that a critic must grasp if she is to feel the proper sentiment. In order to properly grasp the meaning of an artwork, we must take into account the cultural context they were created in. Francis Hutchinson and Alexander Girard both maintain that empirical objects such as math, science, and philosophical theories are objects of taste. Both regard it as a natural assumption that objects of intellect, that is math, science, and what be it, are objects of taste just as much as objects of hearing and sight may be. They believe that grasping the nature of an object takes intellectual work. And this viewpoint kind of reminds me of the quote I hear a lot in the art community that to break the rules, you have to know the rules. I mean, composition has mathematical roots to explain why shapes being arranged in a certain way is more pleasing to the human eye. If you look at color theory, like their color harmonies are dependent on the hue and saturation of a color. And perspective can be something so mathematical that you would spend all day drawing grid lines just to get your piece of art to be as accurate and as representational as possible. These are things we have to know intellectually about art to make good art. But Hutchison and Gerard also include the history of an artwork and how we can judge aesthetics. If you can recall, Hume and Reed maintained that grasping the nature of an object before aesthetically judging it is one thing. Aesthetically judging an object once it's grasped is another. Okay, so what does this mean in English? Kendall Walton brings forth an anti-formalist theory that says, Aesthetic properties we perceive are dependent on that category we perceive an artwork belonging to. Guernica is a great case of this. At first glance, Guernica is perceived as violent, dynamic, and disturbing. Picasso has a way of telling the story of Guernica so clearly without having to say anything at all, and it is one of his most influential pieces. Guernica on its own stands out as an outstanding piece of art. But if we were to think of Guernica as belonging to the category of Guernicas, which is artwork where surfaces are sort of resemble the shapes and colors of Picasso's Guernica, but they protrude from the wall in sort of like this 3D art kind of way. But since we know Picasso intended for Guernica to be a painting and the category of Guernicas came after it, we know to perceive Guernica as belonging to the that category would be false. So context matters. Looking at the painting Guernica, judging it on the nature of the Guernica category would be would make it a bad piece of art. But grasping the nature of Guernica and then aesthetically judging it changes its value entirely.
So let's go back to Duchamp's urinal. Before, Duchamp's urinal probably did not look like anything extraordinary, let alone like a piece of art. But that's kind of what's exactly what makes it so powerful. You see, the Society of Independent Artists sought to challenge the status quo of high society in the art world. They were against the stuffy museums and the elitism that accompanied art. And they really wanted to give contemporary artists a voice. They wanted to give the artists that were challenging the status quo a voice. And I mean, that is to challenge the status quo of what art is. And what better way to do that than to take something like a urinal and put it on display. It's the context of the urinal that gives it its value. Dimitri Daskakalopalos. I'm so butchering that. I'm sorry, Dimitri. <laughs> Paid nearly $2 million just for the mere replicas of the urinal. And he's even stated himself it's because of what the urinal stands for in contemporary art. It is a brash symbol of what it means to challenge the status quo. And that, my friends, is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, I worked so hard to make sure to get this video out in time. So if you're still here, I really do appreciate you. And well, that's it. So I'm filming this early in the morning. I gotta get ready for work, eat some brekkie. Well, bye.